we're going to talk about Hong Kong and how important Hong Kong is. Hong Kong is the most advanced example of what China could be. What the British and the Guangdong people built in Hong Kong is something that is absolutely unmatched anywhere else in the world. I mean, some of you might think Tokyo, some of you might think, I don't know, London, uh, Shanghai, Los Angeles, New York. None of these places come close to Hong Kong when it comes to architecture, infrastructure, society. The whole place is amazing. You've got so many people living in such a small space, and yet it is incredibly beautiful, very well maintained, and I can sum the whole place up with one word, civility. Not only did I get married in Hong Kong previously to a Hong Kong citizen, but I've spent a lot of time in and out for various reasons. You know, for those of us living in mainland China, Hong Kong was always kind of like a little respite. It was a little dab of civility when we couldn't take what was going on in mainland China any longer. A lot of you guys out there might suddenly say, hang on a second, you, how can you say something like that? How can you say that Hong Kong is a, a, a civil place where mainland China isn't? Well, I'm talking about just the general societal norms that you find in mainland China. Things like spitting on the streets, urinating in public, blowing your nose in public. These things happen all around you. Just the general attitude. It's due to the fact that although China has advanced financially in leaps and bounds recently, it's only been a couple of decades and they've all come from dirt, dirt, dirt poor, starving to death to these mega cities beautiful cities, you know, shining skyscrapers, a lot of wealth, big cars, big money. All of that's come really quickly, but unfortunately you cannot bring up the level of sophistication of your average person that quickly too. It takes time, it takes generations. You need to have a parent or a grandparent who can teach you how to behave in public. Hong Kong has strict rules against spitting in public with fines of up to 5,000 Hong Kong dollars. They've got strict rules as to wearing a seatbelt and the way you behave in public, you can't urinate or defecate in public without getting a huge fine or ridicule or everybody turning on you. It has taken a hundred years for Hong Kong to reach where it is now. And I'm not speaking from a colonial Western point of view. I'm speaking from a point of view of civility, public civility. And I think we can all agree that it's not a good idea to take a dump on the streets or to blow your mucus out on the street on someone's shoe. These are the kind of things that I would witness on a daily, if not weekly basis in mainland China. That's not to say that Chinese people on a whole are all uncivilized. It's just that you get to see it all the time. So being able to go over into Hong Kong was always a breath of fresh air because it gets to you. If you've grown up in a developed country, you get used to the idea of people being courteous, holding a door open for you, not blowing their nose on your shoe. And so after months and months and months, in mainland China, seeing this day after day, the, the selfish behavior that very often occurs and all the kind of nonsense that goes around. Going to Hong Kong was always a massive, massive reprieve. But not only from that point of view, from a civility point of view, but also from a freedom of speech point of view. I found it quite incredible that popping over the border, which for me living in Shenzhen would take me 20 minutes, half an hour. And yes, you do need to cross over the border in order to get into uh, Hong Kong, because for all intents and purposes, it's still a different country. I know it's been handed back, but remember, when it was handed back, it's supposed to be a one country, two systems, where Hong Kong law and everything that goes on in there is still under the jurisdiction of, you know, the Hong Kong bureaucrats and all that nonsense, and it shouldn't be meddled with. It should remain the same for 50 years, or however many long it's got to go now, 40 something years. Um, that's all changing, but let me get back to the point of freedom of speech. I was quite blown away that I could walk there and all of a sudden see Falun Gong posters. For those of you who don't know what the Falun Gong is, it's um, kind of a, a religious practice slash cult slash Tai Chi kind of exercise thing where they claim they can cure cancer and do all sorts of things. Either way, it's completely banned in mainland China. You cannot mention it, you cannot practice it. If you try to do anything related to Falun Gong in mainland China, that's it. Tickets for you. But you cross the border, all of a sudden you can see people holding up their signs saying Falun Gong is good, you know, join Falun Gong, etc, etc. But right next to it, you'll see the Chinese government has sent people who oppose this to put up their posters saying Falun Gong is an evil cult. Don't practice it. It's bad, etc, etc. 
And it's amazing to see this contrast, you know, people being able to express differing opinions to the Chinese government because you cannot, in mainland China, have protests, first of all, unless it's against Japan or something that's government condoned. And you cannot voice opinions about things that the government doesn't allow. So for me to see this was always an amazing thing. However, things have taken a bit of a downturn. For those of you who have been keeping up with the news, you'll know that Beijing is trying to push through an extradition law. This is a lot more serious than most people think. Because if this is passed, and it looks like it's going to be passed, it is going to impact Hong Kong severely. You know, I spent a lot of time over there in Hong Kong speaking to locals and, you know, I have family there, had family there and friends there. And a lot of them would complain about how mainland uh, China was reneging on a lot of the promises they made when it was handed over. Remember, it was handed over and they said, here you go. Yes, it belongs to mainland China now, but we're going to leave you guys alone for about 50 years and then, you know, we're going to move you over and assimilate, etc., etc." And everybody thought that, okay, it's daunting, it's coming down the line, but at least they've got those 50 years of freedom and 50 years to, to live life as they always have in Hong Kong. Unfortunately, bit by bit, this freedom has been chipped away. We've seen kidnappings of booksellers, things like that in Hong Kong. We've seen all sorts of dastardly things going on. We've seen pro-Beijing people being inserted artificially into the government in Hong Kong. And there's nothing that the Hong Kong people can do because Unfortunately, it's a place of law. And when you have laws in place, law and order, like in Hong Kong, based on the British system, I know South Africa is exactly the same, but when you have these sort of parliamentary laws and you know all this bureaucracy, it's very easy for people who are unfair to take advantage of these fair laws that are in place. If you're an unlawful government and you want to take advantage of a lawful government that's set up out of compassion to look after the citizens and the people of Hong Kong, it's very easy to find loopholes. And it's very easy to pay people to protest on your behalf. It's very easy to bust people over the border into Hong Kong in order to take part in the protests from the other side. Hong Kong is now fighting a losing battle. And it has been for some time. You know, in 2014, there was this massive umbrella movement uh, it was the first time there were these big protests for democracy in Hong Kong. I was there. I went to the protests. I filmed some of it. I took photos. Of course, at that time, I could never release anything because I was living in mainland China. And if I had an opinion on it, even I would have been deported and cut off and kicked out of the country. And so, of course, I didn't speak about it at the time. But I must say that I was very much impressed by the unity of the Hong Kong people, the way they stood up to these massive terrible changes that are happening in their midst. Admittedly, I've always had a very defeatist attitude when it comes to Hong Kong. You know, I have a friend, Dave, him and I go way back, you know, and uh, he's always been a big part of these protests. He's a, he's a part-time photojournalist and he's a photographer, he's a, a professional photographer. And uh, him and I actually walked around the protest sites because he knows all the people and he goes and he actively participates in all the protests and stuff. And he was uh, showing me around, etc., etc. Thing is, he's always been fighting for democracy and freedom in Hong Kong. And I've always sat down and said to him, well, you know, I don't know what you're fighting for because I've been through it in South Africa. You know, when the ANC took over, it was a similar thing. I'm not talking about race here. I'm talking about an incompetent government taking over what was a competent government. In other words, I'm looking at it from a point of view of running infrastructure, of making sure that the country actually operates and works. You get an incompetent, corrupt government taking over, and they just use corrupt means to defeat the laws that are there in place to try and stop bad things from happening. Same thing, Cape Town still runs well. Cape Town gets a majority vote for the opposing party. What does the ANC do? It busses down ANC members, falsely registers them as residents, gets them to vote over there to sway the vote the other way. So you see the parallels are almost exactly the same. I've lived through a country that was taken over by a different government. I've watched it decline and I've watched all the people fighting to prevent the decline of the country fight in vain. And that's why I've always been very defeatist when it comes to Hong Kong, because I see the parallels. However, there is a very big difference here. In South Africa, if you ever stood up and said that the new government was bad and destroying the country, you would be labeled a racist and immediately shut down and you would have the whole world against you. 
Uh, even if you're not a racist, you just genuinely believe that the new government is destroying the country, which it has. It's already done. It's already destroyed it. It's, it's too late. Difference is in Hong Kong, the local Hong Kong people, the people that are there, and please don't forget that Hong Kong has always been a very important conduit to China. Not only was it a way for people to escape the tyranny and starvation of the Mao Zedong era, where people were literally starving to death, countless people that I've met are descendants or are still people who fled mainland China through Hong Kong and started a new life in the British territory of Hong Kong or from Hong Kong then moved further abroad to America or Canada or the UK, etc., etc. But Hong Kong has always been a conduit into China too for technology. For those in the 80s in China, if you had a VHS player or a Walkman or something like that, it's probably because it was smuggled in from Hong Kong. You wouldn't have gotten it else in any other way, really. So it's been a way in. And also, there's no coincidence that the first special economic zone was opened in Shenzhen, just over the border of Hong Kong. If it wasn't for Hong Kong, China's economy, mainland China's economy, would not have grown. It would not be where it is today. There's no doubt about it. It is such an important financial and shipping hub in Asia that what's happening now with these extradition laws and this meddling is actually a very stupid thing for the Chinese government to do. Because if you destabilize that very important financial hub, if you make it seem as if it's going to just be another Beijing or another Zhuhai or another whatever city, another Hangzhou, you know, the rest of the world's going to turn its back. It's going to become less of an option for shipping and for investment and for financial this and that. And you know what? You're going to lose out. The Chinese government's going to lose out. Hong Kong people are going to lose out. Everyone's going to lose out. I don't understand why they keep meddling. And it's obviously just because they really can't stand this autonomous region, which is beyond their control. That's all I can think of, is that they can't stand the fact that people can say anti-Beijing things or anti-China things in Hong Kong and get away with it. That's why they're trying their best to quash that. And that's what this new extradition law is all about. Because right now, I can stand on the streets of Hong Kong and I can say, down with the CCP. I can stand on the streets of Hong Kong and say, whatever I want. And you know what? No one's going to come, lock me up and spirit me away to a black jail. However, if this extradition law is passed, China can arbitrarily say that I am a fugitive which they do. Remember, there is no rule of law in China. There, I mean, of course, there are laws, but if someone needs to be taken care of, it's very easy to trump up charges and you can disappear. It is just a fact. It's happened tons of times and it can happen at any point in time. So if I were to stand in Hong Kong and say, down with the CCP, maybe good old uh, Winnie the Pooh sees that footage and says, you know what? Screw this guy. He's now a fugitive. He's a criminal. Arrest him. And you know what? They can arrest me in Hong Kong and they can extradite me to mainland China where I can disappear in a black jail for the rest of my life. This is a reality. And this is what the Hong Kong people are fighting against. I hope all of you who are watching this realize just how important this is. If this bill is passed, no one will be safe in Hong Kong. Sure, there are going to be some kind of processes that you have to go through, etc. But you will not be safe. If you become an enemy of China in any way, shape or form, you will not be safe visiting Hong Kong. And this makes me incredibly sad and incredibly angry all at the same time because Hong Kong is the most beautiful city. It is the most amazing international place. And anyone who spent any time there will be able to vouch for that. Foreigners, locals from all over the world getting together, enjoying an amazing lifestyle, an amazing city. It is a jewel in Asia. And I would say probably the most important city in the whole of Asia. I have a message for everyone out there. Firstly, everybody in mainland China, I respect your way of life. I respect your opinions, even if I don't agree with them. What I don't respect are these strong arm tactics by the government, which I know that you have no control over. So when I say China, I'm not talking about you as in a Chinese person. In fact, I've got nothing but respect for those who have the courage to stand up and for those who continue to live their lives despite what goes on around them. I lived in China for 14 years, as you all know. I know what life is like there. I understand exactly what goes on in mainland China. And I have a lot of respect for you guys. For those of you in Hong Kong fighting this, these insurmountable odds, I applaud your courage 
and I have a hell of a lot of respect for you guys. And I know that this doesn't look like it's going to work out right, but I want to let you know that you're not fighting in vain and that you will always have my support at the end of the day, even if it doesn't mean anything. You will always have my support and respect for what you're doing, trying to fight for freedom of speech in a bad situation like you are. And for all my Western audience who watch my videos, I want you to know that I'm not making this video to try and bash China or to try and make Chinese people look bad, because I'm not. Chinese people aren't the enemy here. The enemy is a heavy-handed, strong-arm, brainwashing dictatorship of a government that is moving forward at any cost to quash freedom of speech and any dissent in any way, shape or form against it. And it's very easy to see that through history. It's been like that. We've recently spoken about the Tiananmen Square uh, massacre and things like that. You have to understand that this is the way it operates over there. I hope that you, my Western audience, can understand just how important it is what's going on at the moment and that you could show your support or at least acknowledge what's going on in Hong Kong at the moment. Time to end this off, guys. I know it's a somber video, but I'd like to end by saying that Hong Kong is very much the most impressive, futuristic, beautiful, imposing, amazing, classy... I, I don't even know how to explain it. I can throw so many different adjectives at this thing, but it has made such an impression on my life and anyone else who's visited there. I think everybody who's been there and seen the skyline and been up in the buildings and seen the classy and the local and all this stuff will agree. It is the most amazing, special and unique place in Asia. Guys, all my best. And don't forget, you can catch another Serpents a Day every single Friday <laughs> um, at 1 p.m. EST. You can also catch Lao 86 every single Wednesday at uh, 1 p.m. EST. And we have ADV China on Monday, 1 p.m. EST. And of course, our new podcast, check it out this week. Very, very important. We're going to be dedicating this week's podcast to Hong Kong. So we're going to be talking about our experiences there. We're going to be showing you some never before seen footage of Hong Kong. And, well, can't wait to see you there. Stay awesome.